Loch Ine is a unique nature reserve in West Cork. Rossa Gibbons grew up here on a 50-acre farm in Munnig. After leaving home, he returned in his early 20s and leased land from his parents and began integrating forestry into his farming journey. Planted that when I was 24, maybe. And that's about, yeah, that's, um, that's 19 years now. And that was a mix of oak and larch on the better ground and uh, uh, ash and alder on the poorer ground. And then uh, six years ago, planted another patch, another uh, three hectares of uh, 10 or 11 different species. So um, a lot of natives, oak and European larch and some walnut and a lot of birch and Scots pine. And, and then two years ago, decided to get back into sheep again and um, explored these, um, these Shropshires that you see below. Yeah. And the Shropshires um, were supposed to be good in that the, they were tree friendly. So I, uh, I tried them in, um, in a small patch of six year old woodland and they did no damage. They were in there for six months. So I decided to, to keep them and then planted them. Um, that was that was just last year, but two years two years ago, I uh, decided to plant this agroforestry here through the grant system GPC eleven uh, grant system, and that's there's about ten or eleven species in here too. One of the advantages of agroforestry is that while the farmer will get a forest premium for the trees planted, the land around the trees can still be farmed for agricultural purposes and income. But planning is important. I kind of uh, wanted eight metres. I spoke to my local contractor who was going to be cutting hay for me because I, I like to cut the hay and um, and asked him, you know, how he'd feel about, about driving around and what kind of width he'd need. And uh, we agreed on eight, eight metre spacing. So it worked out that three and a half metres then between each tree, you can still you can still fit a vehicle or a tractor, you know, across the way. Uh, but you can cut, you get two cuts. Uh, of of hay or silage with the eight meters and then when it's a little bit a little bit more dense on on each side is uh, just to, to 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 fill in really to have uh, to make up the numbers you know because you have to have 400 400 trees per hectare so so i cut cut hay or silage in the middle and then a little bit more dense on the edges um it has only five years of a premium but it is forestry land like all the other GPCs, it is still considered a, a forestry land. The only difference is you're allowed to do all of these other things in it. There's huge flexibility. For example, the guy in uh, Clonakilty got uh, 24 large bales of silage uh, per hectare. He had two hectares, so he nearly had about 50 large bales of silage. So that's an income, okay? So that, that was why the five years came about, was because there was this expectation of agriculture produce. Now, we do understand that there has been a somewhat of a limitation when farmers look at other grant and premium categories. They see 15 for all the others and five for agroforestry. And that was originally something that the EU stipulated that they would rather any agroforestry measure would only have five years. But that has been reviewed and uh, I think the EU now are letting member states uh, have greater uh, flexibility in what they can do and what they can offer to farmers. So that is something that has been reviewed. At yeah. The, yeah. Rossa has now established three different forestry schemes on his land. The first planting was done by contractors, but Rossa decided to take on the later establishments himself for a number of reasons. Primarily uh, provenance, I found that the contractors who I won't name um, might have uh, skimped on, on the quality of oak that they were planting. And as a result, my oaks now are sort of misshapen and quite forked and need a lot of management. And I feel that if, uh, if they had planted a, a better provenance side, I'd have a, well, my grandchildren would have a, a better crop in the long run. Yeah. And it's one of the things, isn't it, Rasa, with, with broadleaf trees, especially when you're, when you're growing broadleaf trees, the provenance needs to be right from the get-go. I think so too, yeah. 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 And the other issue was, was um, uh, trench and mounding. And um, I, I suppose it's 20 years ago, so policy might have changed now. Or, 
practice might have changed slightly, but I don't think in pasture that you need necessarily dig trenches and, and mounds. I, I feel it's it's difficult to manage in the in the long run. I think for contractors doing the planting, it might be quick and easy, and that's really where they save money. <clears throat> but I think f in terms of management, I think it's quite it's quite labour intensive to work in woodland that has trenches and mounds on it. Yeah. The first generation of woods planted by Rossa was a large oak mixture, and when it came to thinning he found a good local market. The first thinning I did with Eugene's help was um, was the larch. It was 12 years old at that stage. And I went along the rows of larch. So there's oak and larch in alternating rows. And I went along the rows of larch and thinned them out, uh, took, the, took the bigger ones and, and left the smaller ones, hoping that they'd be better timber in the long run with a tighter grain. And the, the thinnings from all of that I drew down to the yard and I managed to sell for for building in the round. So there was a there was a fellow up in um, in uh, Inniskeen in the Hollies and in Inniskeen you might be familiar with them and they they bought it all off me at, you know better better than firewood prices you know. Another use of the large tinnings shows how continuous planting on a farm can benefit newer generations of planting. When establishing agroforestry, staking and protecting the trees is important. So Rossi used the larch for staking his latest plantings. Uh, half of the stakes um, I bought, these half rounds here, and the other half of them I made, they're, uh, they're quarter rounds from the, the larch plantation because I was thinning the larch anyway, and uh, it occurred to me that they'd make fine stakes. So it was labour intensive, but they worked out, worked out great. Yeah, yeah, you did the mats on it, and you saved you saved a good bit on it. Yeah, they certainly paid for themselves. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it's it's that thing that you were talking about of the first the first generation of wood, paying for started, the next generation. Yeah, started to pay for the for the third generation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And did you do any other treatment of the post bottoms then or no. anything? Okay. No, okay. no. Peel all the bark off. You have to peel the bark off. So that was more labour, like. But if you cut them at the right time of year, the bark just peels off nice and handy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then once you've, once you've staked them here, do you, you plant the tree and then stake, or what's the order? Um, we push the stakes first um, with a digger. Uh, we, we line them up first. We, we had a, some, I had two lads um, ahead of us with the tractor, and they were throwing the stakes out. And we, we lined the stakes up in two rows. And then I had a 22-ton digger here and he was going up the, the middle row and pushing I was running and holding the stakes and he was pushing them in and uh, so he could push you know two left and two right and two left and two right as he as he made his way up and then once the stakes were there planting was really easy because we didn't have to think you know you didn't have to keep to any rows because you had your you had your rows done so um, and then once the tree was planted we put the the sleeve on and then um, and then the second stake in hindsight I might do the two stakes at the same time with the digger um, and do the planting afterwards and then the the, the tube last. Yeah, yeah. But it's all because I mean it, it would be kind of difficult to get the tree in between the two stakes as well so it's... So yeah, yeah I, I didn't try it that way so... Yeah, 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 it's great and it must have been great to be bringing material from because people often yeah. say so you plant trees you'll never see the good of them. Yeah, they're people that don't plant trees I think <laughs> or that wait until they're in their 60s you know but yeah no you can definitely use wood timber that you plant like yeah yeah, 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 yeah it grows yeah. much quicker than yeah. than we imagine since Rossa has taken up farming trees have been part of his long-term vision I suppose if we compare ourselves to our closest European neighbors the French you know each 25 percent of of France is 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 woodland and each farm has a has a bit of woodland that's that's managed and it's just part of culture it's not a you know trees or farm kind of situ situation it's 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 trees on farms yeah. but rossa also realizes that here in ireland we have our own history to deal with and layered on that is dramatic changes in eu policy making developing a forest culture here a long-term project but for rossa growing up so close to Loch Ine nature reserve the benefits of forestry are obvious in the short term. A difficult question to ask. I'd say it is a, a, a cultural shift, and I think um, we've we've been sort of we've been sort of subsequent to to a lot of influence, I suppose, first by through colonial landlords um, and come through poverty, um, where every bit of 
every bit of tree was was valuable and and sort of taken um and since since the 70s then we've been heavily influenced by europe and we've seen different policy changes with european policy first being farmers been told to clear all the ditches and to make the fields bigger and bigger and 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 now with this the new glass system or whatever they're calling it um they're going to you're going to be able to include um scrub land and marginal land and so we're, we're kind of taking a bit of a u-turn in terms of of policy so i suppose naturally enough farmers are sort of suspicious and and um you know they they there there's certainly a lot of risks yeah, and, and uncertainties yeah. for them from school i'm only learning really about ecosystem service a fancy term that scientists use for for things that we we know are uh, traditionally we would have known are were effective like shade and shelter really pri- primarily so yeah. like eugene said uh, uh, animal welfare read a paper there s- s- showing uh, that lambs born in agroforestry have 50% better mortality rates. That's if you're lambing outside, you know, which is quite yeah. significant for the farmer. Yeah. Yeah. And other things like uh, like erosion, you know yourself, you've seen um, all the, these, these these flash floods recently. If you stand at the bottom of a, of a, of a, of a modern reclaimed field, you see the, the water is not, um, not clear, you know, it's, you know, it's leaching yeah. all of the minerals and, and nutrients yeah. out of the soil. So yeah. agroforestry really stands to, mitigate against against uh, erosion and then there's nutrient cycling too i suppose a big thing you know so the all the the leaves falling down and if you're if you're growing something like rubinia that's nitrogen fixing then you're you're improving your pasture all the time so so i suppose uh the the benefits for me i feel are in 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 a short-term service provision rather than in the long-term provision of timber i see the the agroforestry is beneficial for what it what it'll supply in the what it'll provide yeah. in the short term